us today Shlomi Nisim, our Performance Center R&D Manager, and Eyal Rosner, our Performance Center System Architect. So let's start. Shlomi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eliza. Uh, thanks, everyone, for dedicating the time and joining us uh, to this webinar. Um, really excited seeing uh, some of the names of the participants, uh, customers of ours that are helping us on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, so I'm really, um, really appreciate the, the time that you spent and um, um, dedicating for uh, seeing this webinar. An issue with this small screen over here, which keeps on getting focus. All right, before we dive into the details, um, we'd like to uh, reiterate what we mentioned in the previous webinars. Uh, basically, that the, last, that the latest release of Performance Center is 1255. It includes a wealth of new functionality, uh, such that basically makes Performance Center more relevant in the DevOps space. I encourage those of you who didn't uh, start experimenting it uh, to, to do so. We are in transition with the product towards um, much better alignment with DevOps and uh, more flexible deployment. Um, so please uh, uh, stay uh, updated with the most recent releases and uh, enjoy from the latest editions. Uh, I also encourage you guys to have a look at the Load Runner and PC blog. It includes uh, a lot of blog posts, uh, both in the protocols area as well as in the uh, application side in Performance Center. Uh, these blogs are very educated, and you can share them uh, with the rest of the members in your organization. I'm sure that uh, they can make uh, a lot of benefit from it. And also our YouTube channel where we upload uh, most of the webinars. And again, it's not uh, strictly uh, uh, limited only to Performance Center. It includes also load runner parts and uh, protocols um, and might be very beneficial for everyone. Uh, finally, before I'll uh, start diving into the details, I would like to mention that 1256 is uh, just around the corner. Uh, it introduces a wealth of enhancement and new functionality. We focus this version on addressing a lot of enhancement requests from customers and also, um, and also uh, some new functionality, very interesting. Um, so I really uh, encourage everyone to, um, to experiment that as soon as it uh, goes out. Someone just asked a question regarding the link to the blog post. So you have the link inside the slide deck. Uh, once you'll get the slide deck, you will be able to just to reach the slide, click on the link, and you are there. All right, let's talk about the agenda for this meeting. So basically, um, the first three uh, areas are more oriented towards the performance engineers, although I, I, I pretty much uh, think that the performance center administrator will find it interesting as well. The first thing is just introducing the controller options. These are uh, capabilities that are somewhat um, from what I've seen, some uh, users were not aware uh, of their existence in Performance Center, so I wanted to put the spotlight on that in order to and give some uh, advices around that. Um, also, I'd like to mention a few test considerations um, in order for you to um, to consider uh, before de when designing a test and before running it. Uh, you will be able to basically uh, take that into consideration and uh, apply when uh, when needed. And finally, uh, for the performance engineer, also some uh, considerations about the analysis application, and especially when it comes to dealing with larger uh, larger test results, uh, something that we are going to uh, treat and address in the long-term agenda as well. Uh, but for now, um, since the capabilities are there, um, you and you still need to to uh, conduct the day-to-day -day work. Uh, there are some tips around that as well. For the admin part, we would like to cover some possible deployments of of Performance Center. There are some uh, questions here and there in the in the community um, forum. And also, uh, we get oftentimes uh, questions coming from different sources uh, from our support team. So we started, we, we basically consolidated a few possible deployments. Uh, th these are just examples. 
but uh, from these examples, you will be able to deduce like uh, what you can potentially do with Performance Center in the general aspect of it. Um, also, we'd like to put some focus uh, on the host management and basically describe a bit uh, the different types of host and uh, various considerations that you need to make sure uh, that, um, that exist in your environment. And finally, um, some recommendations regarding uh, the resources assignment to pools and um, basically uh, what is the best practice around that. So it's a, a lot on our plate. Uh, uh, I would appreciate if you dedicate uh, 15 more minutes behind the original uh, schedule. Let's start with the controller options. So first, uh, first of all, the controller options is basically the equivalent for the Load Runner controller options. Uh, those of you who are uh, familiar with Load Runner as well, then when you open the controller, there is a tools menu, and there you have um, um, uh, an options uh, item. When you click that, um, a dialog opens that basically allows you to configure application-wide uh, settings that um, so significant part of them are applicable uh, for the way the uh, load runner communicates with the load generators and uh, all sorts of timeout settings and things like that. In Performance Center, the capability is available from my Performance Center from this menu uh, on the top. So you can see the controller option starting 1255, it's available from my Performance Center. Before 1255, it's available uh, uh, for only from ALM client. In a similar um, menu item in ALM, when you open, there, you will see more options, but one of them is actually the controller options. It's important to note that the controller option in Performance Center are actually uh, applicable for the entire project. That means that uh, whenever you change something, all of the tests that are going to be executed from that point on uh, will um, will uh, run under that configuration. Um, and also, if you have contradicting uh, settings of, from a different project, uh, then uh, these settings will be applied for that test, even if the same host is being used for from different projects. So there will, uh, th th there will not be a collision between the projects, because Performance Center takes care of the settings when the test is being initialized. Uh, however, you do need to consider within the same project whether um, a specific setting is relevant for uh, all of the tests that are being run, uh, being executed from that project, or uh, for a handful of them or a specific ones. So some some of the settings maybe it makes sense to uh, set it as a project level settings and uh, make it permanent. Some others, maybe you want to do that on a per need basis only for a specific test and then uh, revert it back to the default. Let's give a few examples for settings like that. So we'll start uh, with the uh, collate uh, settings. So uh, as you can see, the, the, the dialog once opened, uh, there are uh, various different options regarding monitors, runtime settings, uh, some timeouts, and so on. Um, one of the options is collate settings. So in the collate uh, settings, you can find um, basically two uh, main uh, categories. One of them is related to uh, the output MDB file. So this file, uh, when the test ends, uh, as you know, the, this file includes all the errors uh, of the virtual users in the test and some additional errors, uh, maybe uh, for monitors configurations and such. Um, Needless to say that performance engineers really like this type of information because it helps them uh, later on understanding what happened during the test run. Uh, therefore, Performance Center uploads uh, this data as a separate file to the result collection, uh, to, 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 the, to the file uh, collection of, uh, of, a, of a given run. So you can download this file individually regardless of uh, what we are talking about here in this option. So this option basically means that uh, whether or not to include this file also in the raw result.zip file. Uh, by default, uh, this uh, the output MDB is included in there 
only if the size is uh, smaller than 100 megabytes. So um, you can choose either to exclude it altogether and uh, settle with uh, the standalone copy that is uploaded regardless. And by that, you can actually reduce the size of the raw result.zip, uh, reduce the chances for possible failures in case there were many errors in the run. Like, for example, if you know that you are going to run a huge test uh, so maybe you can uh, exclude uh, exclude this file before running the test. Um, uh, if you don't expect any errors to to happen, then it's um, it's not a major factor. But uh, if you do anticipate some errors, then uh, I think it's better to to exclude it and maybe then revert it back to to something else. Maybe you wanna apply. Maybe you you wanna uh, increase the size over here to a larger one. Um, in case you would like to include the file in um, in more cases. So basically just note that this option exists and um, you can play with it in order to increase the chances um, of, uh, uh, of avoiding from a possible uh, failure in case of a large uh, test execution. Um, another consideration is with uh, the collator timeout. So uh, we hear uh, every now and then that uh, customers are facing with collate options. We also um, uh, were lucky to, to have some customers collaborating with us in order to troubleshoot it uh, and in their own environment. Uh, while investigating that, we saw um, in a significant part of, uh, of the cases that by increasing the collate timeout, we uh, basically solve, solve the issue without uh, changing uh, the, the, the code at all. So um, uh, I suggest uh, when you, if you face uh, collate, uh, collate failures on a constant basis, I suggest uh, trying first to increase the, the timeout over here. Let me just explain a bit what, is the, what are the implications of, uh, of increasing this timeout. Uh, the timeout is not for the entire operation. The timeout is basically just for the uh, making sure that uh, if the load generator and controller uh, were not communicating or were not transferring files for uh, for a specific uh, period of time, like uh, these timeout settings, uh, then Performance Center will basically announce that maybe something is wrong and uh, stop stop the operation and uh, stop the, the entire collate process. So in such case, uh, what we saw at least is that uh, sometimes there are uh, large files that takes uh, takes uh, some time to uh, to zip or to perform some operation in the load generator side, and uh, only after that operation has ended, then the file uh, starts to be to, to, to be transmitted and. Uh, uh, before it is being transmitted, Performance Center uh, determines that uh, the, the, there is a possible failure in the load generator and stop the, the, the operation. By increasing the, the, the timeout to 10 minutes in the cases that we have tried, uh, the, um, it was successful. Sometimes it might require a bit more. Regardless of all that, um, we are continuous, uh, continuously checking uh, uh, how to improve this process and uh, maybe in the future to avoid uh, doing that at all. Uh, but for now, um, this option is very useful in order to troubleshoot collate issues. Uh, those of you who are using the diagnostics integration, uh, so the same is applicable uh, over there. And actually, the diagnostics files are really, really big. So uh, in that case, uh, maybe we need to consider actually changing the default option. Uh, the, 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 the default timeout settings, but um, in any case, um, it is recommended also to increase this one in case of failures. All right, let's uh, see some other options that are interesting and might be relevant. So um, if you want to avoid the initialization or stop run failures, then uh, the timeout section is the place that you want to look at, uh, because um, in here, um, you can actually customize the time that, uh, that the controller waits for a connection to the load generator or disconnection from the load generator, and also uh, uh, operations that are related to the virtual users, like uh, how much time it takes to initialize, 
how much time it, it takes to, to run and pause and so on. So basically the transition between the, virt the, the virtual user states, they have uh, timeouts and, um, and these timeouts can be controlled uh, from here. These default values in most of the cases, they are sufficient. So I wouldn't rush into changing that. But um, if you continuously see um, slow connection to a load generator, by slow connection to a load generator, I basically mean uh, from the time the controller is being initialized, then there is a connection to the, to, to the load generator. Uh, you see that uh, it takes a lot of time. So uh, sometimes you can troubleshoot that even by actually invoking the controller itself, uh, regardless of performance center and trying to connect to that uh, particular load generator in order to see how much time it takes. Um, so if you see uh, cases like that, then you can increase the timeout and uh, basically uh, avoid, uh, avoid connection failure. And by that, you can increase the success rate of uh, test run execution, and the test will be initialized properly. Um, Increasing this timeout, and actually something that I didn't mention regarding the previous graph, increasing the timeouts over here means that um, if there is a real issue and uh, the, a real failure is supposed to happen, it means that you will basically wait for longer until, the, until it is announced as a problem. Because as long as the timeout uh, didn't reach, then um, Performance Center will not announce it as, a, as an issue. So this is basically the, the, the drawback of uh, increasing the values. But uh, again, in most of the cases, uh, if you do so, uh, then it will basically uh, allow a better work stream. Uh, regarding the virtual users um, in the initialization stage and the stop stage, uh, so oftentimes uh, there is a lot of logic within the script that uh, is basically uh, forcing uh, long initialization time uh, in such case, I would first recommend on the, trying to minimize the, the amount of logic in the init section uh, to, the, to the required logic and not necessarily start doing uh, a lot of custom things. If you do need to, to do a lot of custom things that are not necessarily related to the initialization of the virtual user, you can always create an additional action and uh, play with it in the run logic to run it only once. And then the init phase will end, and the, the next section will start playing, will finish, and then you can uh, create a, a run section that, that iterates over it or something like that. But um, the, the, the thing is that um, if you face uh, initialization issues for the virtual users, so first check the script. If you, if you think the script is OK, you can increase the timeout over here and allow more time for the init phase. Um, there are more cases from my experience that I saw in the past and, um, and while engaging with customers when stopping uh, the, the test and stopping the virtual users. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it takes a lot of time, it lags, and uh, uh, this actually it may be because of uh, logic that, uh, uh, of the script and some other settings that we will, we, we will reach to in a second. But in any case, uh, uh, Performance Center uh, the, will basically uh, stop this operation regardless of the state of the virtual users in case the reservation time uh, has ended. So if you see uh, zombie processes or MDRV processes being left on the load generator, it might be because of uh, reasons like that. And in uh, such cases, I suggest uh, giving more time uh, to the stop stage or, um, or actually reducing the time over here and, uh, and kind of uh, accept the, the failure uh, of the virtual user at the end. Uh, you will not lose all the data that the virtual user reported. So in any case, uh, you can later on um, uh, enjoy from uh, the analysis information uh, also regarding that, that virtual user. Um, so it, it is a consideration that needs to be taken. Um, also with regards to, uh, to stopping virtual user, so uh, there is the section in the runtime settings like um, how the controller treats um, 
the virtual user when stopping uh, when stopping them. So uh, by default, Performance Center waits for the current iteration to end before stopping. So imagine that you have a script with many actions, and um, the script is actually uh, the there is an instruction either of the scheduler or uh, the, an instruction by the user to stop the test. What happens that uh, this instruction basically uh, goes to the controller, the controller uh, communicates to all the, all the load generator and send the stop action. Uh, the virtual user eventually gets this, uh, gets this command and what, what they do is just uh, act according to this, uh, to, to this option. So they will wait for the current iteration to end. The longer the iteration takes, the longer it will take the virtual user to stop. Um, after the iteration ends, the virtual user will also execute the end action. And um, if the end action is also contains a lot of logic, then it obviously will take more time. So in case you have large load tests, uh, or if you experiment uh, every now and then, um, virtual users that are not stopping appropriately. Uh, you may want to try uh, shortening that by either uh, choosing that uh, stop immediately as the default option, uh, maybe for particular tests, not necessarily uh, globally for all of the tests, uh, but for large load tests in order to avoid the uh, failures and lagging at the end, uh, so maybe you can consider that. Just know that if you are uh, if you have only a single action in the script and um, you switch between uh, wait for current iteration to wait for current action, it will not do, uh, it will not change anything because um, it's basically waiting for the current action, it's the same thing. The current, this option, the second option is relevant only when you have multiple actions in the script, uh, then it makes sense. Uh, when it comes to uh, initialization of the load generator of the of the virtual users on the load generator, it is um, the, the default basically uh, restricts uh, the the load generators to initialize um, almost 1,000 virtual users uh, by default, uh, 999. Um, and it means that if you will try to initialize more at the same time, let's say in a large load test, then what the controller will do is will just buffer that and, um, and initialize it gradually. The, the whole point of uh, this user's quota over here is basically to avoid the uh, uh, saturation of the load generator resources during the initialization phase. Oftentimes, the initialization phase is uh, very time, uh, very resource consuming. A lot of resources, uh, like the, the virtual user is basically, uh, has no state yet. Um, the load generator is kind of kicking off uh, in terms of the running the test. Uh, all of the, um, the, the process is being spawned. Uh, the operating system needs to allocate uh, uh, the resources for each and every process and so on. And uh, especially when it comes to um, GUI virtual users, such as Citrix and TrueClient and SubGUI, the virtual user itself is kind of heavy because it loads uh, a bigger client. And uh, it's kind of a celebration of uh, IO resource consumption and CPU and memory utilization and so on. All of it is kind of being done at the same time. So. If you are running, if a particular project is running uh, mostly uh, using GUI level scripts, uh, I would definitely recommend reducing the, the, the number of the, of the virtual users that can be initialized simultaneously to a much lower value. Um, if, however, you stick with the web HTTP protocol and other transport level protocol, then the current value is probably okay. It also depends on the strength of the load generator itself. So just understand the logic, and then you can apply apply uh, based on your common sense and understanding what is the best option uh, for your project. All right, I'm going to switch to test consideration. Uh, I would like to apologize if I'm running too fast. Uh, you will get the recording and the slide deck. Uh, I, we just have a lot of content to, to accomplish, so 
I hope that it's not too fast. In the test considerations, I'd like to start with a test options dialogue. So um, as far as I know, um, many of our users, unfortunately, are not familiar with this option because there is a small button located at the top of the page over here. Uh, but it uh, reveals some uh, interesting options that uh, I will I will focus only on uh, part of them, uh, but uh, others are very interesting in terms of uh, functionality. We are more oriented for tips and tricks, so I'll, I'll talk about the possible failures and uh, maybe how to avoid them. So um, there is an option in the test level to avoid collating the virtual user log. This can reduce uh, the chances for failures. This can reduce the size of uh, of the total uh, files that are being um, uh, collected from uh, from the load generators. Um, I, I wouldn't uh, disable that uh, in a normal test. Normal test uh, should be fine. Um, but uh, in case you have a large load test um, and you can manage without the virtual user logs. Let's say that uh, for the majority of the cases, uh, you can manage without them and maybe settle with the errors that appear in the output MDB, for example. Then uh, I would recommend on disabling for large load tests, and then the collate uh, will, will be faster. Uh, another interesting option is the, the system resource uh, monitors uh, located uh, in the uh, that, that are basically uh, monitoring the load generators. So by default, uh, when you run a test, uh, Performance Center uh, automatically creates uh, uh, Microsoft-based uh, monitors for the load generators um, and uh, and for the uh, for for the hosts that are part participating in the test. That is in order to give you the capability to later on in the or while running the test or later on after analyzing it uh, post run to see if a potential uh, uh, performance issue uh, was caused by a saturation of the load generator resources or by a different or, or by the application itself. So obviously it's a very important capability, uh, but just note that. Uh, Sometimes it takes uh, it takes a lot of time to initialize uh, these monitors, especially when there is a very big latency between the controller and the load generators. I'm not talking about load generators over firewall because for these uh, there is a different mechanism for uh, creating these these monitors. So, but I am talking about load generators that uh, have um, latency like a relatively high latency from the controller machine. And in, the, in these cases, the initialization can take a lot of time, especially if you have a lot of load generators in the same test. Um, they are all being initialized in parallel, uh, but still, the initialization of the monitor might take time. So if you encounter uh, initialization failures uh, because, uh, because of this reason, then note that this option allows you to disable that. Um, if you didn't, just forget about it. Just know that it exists and use it if needed. All right. Uh, I want to move uh, to discuss a bit runtime settings and to explain how it works in Performance Center. Um, so basically, the, the, the by default runtime settings uh, for the scripts are being taken uh, from the script files. So as you know, you create a script in Vuegen, you save uh, you save the script uh, locally. Um, it has runtime settings files, uh, and uh, the script will run uh, according to these files. So as long as um, as long as you, you do not uh, you do not modify the, the the settings in Performance Center, the the settings are actually taken from the files in the script, with two exceptions. Uh, Performance Center overrides, by default, the log and the think time settings. The reasoning for that is basically to avoid uh, utilizing the, um, the I.O. 
in the CPU um, of the load generators. So in case you do need a performance center to, um, to allow the virtual users to write data to the log or to, uh, if you don't, if you are not interested in uh, replaying the think time, for example, then you need to override uh, the script runtime settings. But the way you do that is basically by configuring the runtime settings uh, in the test itself. So basically, um, probably all of you already know, you can open the runtime settings from the, from the test design. Once you change uh, the runtime settings in the test design, a copy of the runtime settings is being saved in the ALM database. From that point on, Performance Center uh, will take the runtime settings from the database for that particular script. If there are other scripts in the same scenario which you didn't open the runtime settings and you didn't modify them, it will still be taken from the script itself. So the, the, the settings is per script. If you download later on the script locally and change the runtime settings and uploaded it back to ALM, the runtime settings will not be picked up in the test level because there is a copy in the database already and the uh, performance center will respect the, the copy in the database. So in order to, in order to, uh, to ensure that the new runtime settings are being picked up, you can basically either open the runtime settings in Performance Center and, and do the same modification and save, or remove the script and reassign it to the, to the test. And by that, uh, you, Performance Center will take the default uh, runtime settings uh, from the script. So it, it's important to, to note that um, if you change the log settings and the think time settings, in Performance Center, Performance Center will respect this option and uh, will, uh, will work according to it. So again, um, the default option is basically to, uh, to disable login. This is what you will see even if it was checked in ViewGen when you upload to Performance Center and you open the runtime settings in Performance Center UI, you will see that unchecked. It is recommended to keep it this way, but if you want to enable, Performance Center will respect it. And the same is applicable for the think time. So I'm not going to go over that again, but this is basically the, the default setting that Performance Center enforces. All right, I want to move to the scheduler. Um, so in the scheduler, um, basically I, wanna, I, I want you to pay attention specifically to the, to the initialization of the test of the virtual user. So in this part, um, oftentimes I saw uh, uh, users Trying to trying to ramp up uh, the virtual users uh, very fast and uh, uh, quantities uh, the amount of virtual users that are not necessarily aligned with what the load generator is capable of dealing with, and especially when it comes to GUI-based virtual users such as sub GUI, true client, and Citrix. So all I want to say around that is just pay attention. Uh, Note that uh, all the things that I said before are applicable, and this is where you can actually control it. Uh, it is better to, uh, init to to take some more time for initializing and have the, the, the total amount of virtual users uh, uh, properly initialized and running, rather than uh, suffering from failures uh, while the virtual users are trying to, to initialize. So you, that you can control basically by a more moderate ramp up. Um, if you, uh, if your experience uh, thought you that um, that uh, that is that the load generator is capable of handling uh, a more rapid pace, uh, then of course uh, do not change that. Just note that there is an implication because again the initialization phase is very resource consuming, especially when it comes to uh, GUI virtual users. Um, oh, the last portion uh, for the performance engineer is basically the analysis options. So first I would like to note that um, you can uh, associate an analysis template with the, the test itself. Uh, this is a feature that exists, I think, from uh, Performance Center 12.20. Uh, 
already. Um, it basically gives you the, the capability to define uh, which graphs you would like to see at the end and which graph will be automatically included in the HTML report. Um, the analysis template, when you create it, you do that in the standalone analysis application, and uh, in there, you will basically, uh, the, uh, the, the amount of graphs that are open in that given session will be saved into the template. My recommendation over here will be to save the, the mandatory graphs that you really need uh, to appear in, um, in the HTML report and in the analysis session. The more graph you add, uh, the more memory the analysis will consume when analyzing the data and uh, the more chances that uh, failures will happen and again especially when it comes to large large tests for small tests uh, it is less likely to, to happen but still uh, the recommendation is basically to uh, to limit only to, to the mandatory graphs um, Another point to consider is basically the database that the analysis application is uh, is working with. So, Performance Center has a, a, an OS type called Data Processor. This OS basically uh, has the analysis application installed on top of it, and uh, by default, uh, uh, the the test is uh, the the analysis application is using Access Database. Uh, in case the result side is uh, bigger, Performance Center automatically configures the analysis application to use SQLite. In case that is not sufficient uh, for you, you can modify the, the options in the analysis application on the data processor machine and configure that to use SQL Server. In such case, um, you just need to ensure that this uh, SQL Server is also accessible from uh, the desktop application from the desktop of the performance engineers in order to um, in order to be able to download the raw result and actually use it otherwise if the if the SQL server is not accessible from the desktop the performance engineers will not be able to to do anything with the results uh, finally uh, basically a recommendation for large low tests uh, large low test includes a lot includes a lot of data we are working towards a different model which will allow uh, sustaining uh, all the data so hopefully that will come in the future but for now uh, when you have large load tests uh, um, you may consider changing the analysis option locally on your machine to generate summary data only the summary data only is an aggregated data and uh, is not as accurate as the as the complete data but it, uh, the Creating the analysis data will happen much faster and will allow you to, uh, to determine whether uh, further uh, investigation needs to happen. So um, basically in large load tests, um, uh, when you download the raw result locally to your machine, you can configure uh, to generate the summary data only, uh, create the analysis data review the results should you think that there is a need to deep dive uh, you can change the settings close and reanalyze uh, with the complete data uh, and of course this uh, this is an option also for the data processor only in that case you will probably need to contact the administrator uh, for him to do that so um, with that uh, we'll start actually uh, transition to the more administrative uh, part so Eyal uh, please lead the way. Thanks, Lomi. Let's take a look at some concrete examples of possible performance center deployments and the communication between the different components. We'll start with a basic deployment where you can see the client can connect to either the ALM server using port 8080 or the performance center server using port 80. These are the default ports. In addition, we can see the performance center core components. So we have the ALM server, which provides the user management, entity management, as well as the main server that interacts with directly with the database, and manage the assets that are being saved in the file repository, in the ALM repository. The PC server is the orchestrator of the performance-related functionality, such as editing a load test, running a load test, viewing the load test data while it's running, and more. 
In addition, it also orchestrates the lab-related operations. There are also the ALM repository and the database server. The components who are responsible for driving the test are PC host, which is actually control the test while it's running, transfer the wor workload to the load generators, and collect the uh, test data while it's running. And at the end of the test, it collects the result files from the load generators and analyzes them. And the load generator is responsible for driving the workload against the application under the test. Here we can see an over firewall deployment, where if you look at this diagram, most of the components you already saw in the basic diagram, but there are cases where the application under the test is running behind, behind the firewall, and in order to test it, you need to, uh, to place the load generator and the monitor of a firewall agent in the same network so that they will have access to the application under test. In order to achieve that and communicate with these components, we, we, should, we, are, we have the MI listener, which acts as the mediator between the load generator and the monitor of a firewall agent, and the performance center server and PC host. You can notice here that since they are behind the, fire, behind the firewall, they are connecting the MI listener using an outgoing communication. Just as a note, the arrow direction is pointing actually the, the side who initiate the connection toward the destination server. So the PC server is connecting the load generator mostly for system health related uh, for system health purposes, while the PC host connect the load generator in order to transfer the wo workload and collect the result when the test ends, as well as data that is provided during the test. And in addition, it connects the monitor of a firewall agent in order to collect monitor's metric during the test. Here we can see a more advanced deployment. So you can notice that so you can notice that the upper part is actually contains all the components we already uh, examined for the basic and over firewall deployments. And in addition, we are showing here the integration the, the performance center have with APM tools. So we can see here two APM tools provided by Microfocus, which are diagnostics and site scope server and site scope. And in addition, there are third-party APM tools, such as New Relic and Dynatrace, that were uh, supported starting from Performance Center 1255, and AppDynamics, which is planned to be supported in the next version. In regards to cloud deployment, Performance Center support running a load generator in the cloud, either in a public cloud or a virtual private cloud. The ports being used are configurable, and in this specific example, we have used the common HTTP ports 80 and 443. To have a secure communication, you can define SSL using two-way authentication. For more, for more information, you can refer to the documentation guide of Performance Center. OK. Um, Another deployment for cloud is basically deploying everything in the cloud. We see a trend of customers doing so. First, we would like to say that it is supported, and in such deployment, you can also have load generators running on-premise. In that case, you will use the open firewall deployment so that they will be able to communicate with the cloud components. Uh, the cloud deployment, in general, is ident identical to the on-premise deployment. All the left part, the ALM server, performance center server, PC host, and, and database, and all the others, needs to be deployed by you in whatever cloud provider you decide, and it should be done according to the installation guide, while the load generators can be provisioned using the built-in capabilities that performance center allows. Specifically, in AWS, we offer built-in images that you can leverage. 
From all these deployments, you can deduce that you can deploy performance center in various different ways and various different combinations. And as I mentioned earlier, these are just an examples, and you can mix match between those examples and do whatever makes sense to you, as long as you comply with the, with the installation guide instructions. As for, for performance consideration, it is, be, it is better to deploy the component in the left side in the same region. Okay. In the examples, we saw the core components of Performance Center. Let's take a closer look at different host types, specifically the standalone load generator and the Performance Center host. Let's start by just describing the different host types that the Performance Center supports. So we have the controller, which controls the test ex execution, including scheduling of the virtual users, as well as collecting monitors data and other related test information that is presented during the test. In addition, the controller is also responsible for collecting the data being saved on the load generators during the test. It collects the data when the test ends. The load generator is the component that drives the workload, and the data processor is responsible for, for analysis-oriented use cases. We will elaborate on that later. From installation perspective, there are three, three types of installation that can, be, that can basically serve for the host type that we just covered. The performance center host, which can be used either as a controller or as a data processor, as well as the load generator. We will discuss that shortly, but basically, the performance center host is a component that can be logically purposed to different functional roles. There are two more installations, both of them for load generators, the standalone Windows load generator and the standalone Linux load generator. OK, so we get a lot of questions from customers asking which type we should use. Should we install all the machines as a performance center host or as a standalone load generator? In general, there is, no good, there is no one good answer for that. There are different considerations, and eventually you need to select which one to apply. The following table will give some context into it and provide you information that allows you to better choose which installation, installation type to use according to your needs. The standalone load generator can only serve as a load generator, while the performance center host can serve as multiple different purposes. You can purpose a performance center host in any combination of a controller, data processor, and load generator. OK, so in case you need to run a load generator behind the firewall, or you want to run a load generator on a Linux machine, then you should choose the standalone load generator. In addition, if you run a containerized load generator, then you can use the Docker image for the standalone Linux load generator. Currently, we support Linux only. But in future, we are planning to, to add support for, Windows, for containerized Windows load generator, and as well as containerized performance center host. In regards to cloud deployment, for the load generators, MicroFocus deliver out-of-the-box images of AWS that you can use and provision the machine using the uh, provision capabilities in Performance Center. The Performance Center host can also run on the cloud, but it, should, it, should, it will be managed by the customer as long as it complied with the installation or deploy and deployment guide. In regards to the number of services, on a standalone load generator, there are two services running. One of them is being used for the lab-related operations, while the other one is, is being used to transfer the, wor the workload, communicate with the controller, and collecting the results when the test ends. In regard to lab management, from lab management perspective, while there is a complete support for the performance center host related operations like system health, maintenance tasks, rebooting the machine, 
Installing a patch and various different functions the, that Performance Center administration allows. A standalone load generator support, support most of it, but there are a few differences which the Performance Center uh, host allows and the standalone load generator doesn't. Our intent is to provide the complete functionality in the future. But for now, just know that there is a slight difference between the standalone load generator and the PC host when it comes to lab management. Let's take a closer look at the data processor machine, which is being used for analysis-oriented operations. So on the data processor, the load runner application is installed. By it is being used when creating analysis data for a test that was ended with data collation only, as well as publishing trending data, and recalculation of SLA. This can happen when you change the SLA and want to recalculate and see the results. Let's see where the data processor machine is coming to play. Assume you executed a load test using performance center host and load generators against the application under the test, and the test was ended without analyzing the results. And later on, you'd like to analyze the results. This is where the data processor is being used. In order to perform the analysis operations for the test, the data processor connects to the ALM to download the raw results, and then extract it locally and invokes the analysis application in order to create the analysis data. In addition, it applies the analysis template in case analysis template was configured for the test. Finally, the data processor uploads the generated files which among them are the HTML report and results.zip, so that these files become available from the performance, performance Center user interface for the users to view and to download locally to the user's machine in case needed. The same flow will happen also when you publish trending results and when you recalculate SLA, only that in these cases, there is no need in the raw results if the results.zip is already existed. In that case, the data processor will download the result.zip, and using the analysis application on the data processor, it will perform the requested operation and update the ALM server accordingly. As you can see from these use cases, the role of the data processing machine is really important. And without having a data processor available in that time for use, some main fu path functionality will be pending, and this is where the data processor queue comes into play. In general, whenever you create analysis data or publish trend report or recalculating SLA, what Performance Center is doing is basically queuing a task that the data processor will eventually pick up and handle. After the task was queued, the system tries to find an available data processor machine, and in case there is such machine, a data processing time slot is being created. If no data processor is available, the task will wait in the queue until an available data processor will be found. From user perspective, you can see these tasks in the data processor queue dialog, which is available from the host page in My Performance Center, and from the test runs page in the ALM client. As you can see in this example, this particular test, test run is waiting for, analyze, for analyzing. If for some reason you don't have a data processor defined in your pool, or not available, the run state will be in pending creating analysis data. If a data processor is not, is not available at all, the task will be deleted from the queue after two days, so it's better to ensure a data processor is available. We've seen in a customer's environment cases where since no data processor was available, many runs got stuck in this state, and the users eventually downloaded the raw results and analyzed the results locally on their analysis machine, which is obviously supported, but it's not ideal, because you can leverage the data processor and let the server handle it for you. In order to stop this operation, you can click on the Stop Operation button. Yeah. Alternatively, if for some reason the task is getting stuck in the data processor queue, you can open the data processor queue dialog and select the relevant 
the relevant row of the run and click on the remove from the queue, which will clean the selected task. Obviously, from each project, you can only see the tasks that are related to that project. But the Performance Center administrator can see the data processor queue for the system-wide perspective and can handle, handle such failures as well. Let's discuss some uh, recommendation regarding the data processor usage. Basically, it is recommended to assign at least, data at least one da data processor per pool. The reason for that is according to what we have said earlier in order to keep the performance center functionality flowing and ensuring nothing gets stuck. In addition, it is recommended not to assign additional roles to that performance center host, but rather keep it as a data processor only from the simple reason that if, for example, it is being used with the purpose of controller or load generator as well, it might be allocated as part of a test and thus will not be available for data processing operations until the load test it participates in is ended. Once in a while, it is advised to check the data processor queue and ensure you don't have any pending tasks in there. And if there is a pending task, try to understand why. Check since when the task is in the queue and what is the reason for that for which it happened. Should you need any help, you can raise a support ticket and we'll be happy to assist you. In case you have a large load test, it is, it is advised to use late analyze rather than to analyze the data as part of the post run actions. The two main reasons for doing that are that the analysis operation for large tests might take more time than the reservation of the test allows. And the fact that when you analyze the results as part, as part of the post-run actions, all the resources that were reserved for the test are not released for other usage until the analysis operation ends. When using the late analysis operation only, uh, analysis operation, only the available data processor is being reserved in a data processing time slot, while the rest of the resources can be used to run other tests. And now, Shlomi will talk about the pools management. Thank you very much, Eyal. Um, so, uh, just uh, from my conversation with customers, I've seen uh, many cases and also uh, questions in the support forums that uh, people are asking uh, how it is better to um, to, our, to set up uh, to arrange the resources within uh, within my pools. So this section is actually pretty short, let's say 10 minutes or so, so I appreciate if you will dedicate this extra time in order to, to review this with us. Uh, first, I'd like to explain the, uh, the, the entity relations. So we have the host that we spoke, that they all spoke about. Uh, there is a host pool and a project. Basically, a host can be associated with as many pools as you want. It's an end-to-end -end relation there is no limitation over here. You can include uh, the same host multiple times, and uh, and then you can uh, you can uh, associate multiple project to the same pool. So the the only limitation in this model is basically uh, the project that can be associated only with a single pool. But because of the reason that you can associate any host to any pool then you can basically uh, you can basically create any uh, constellation that you may think of and uh, I, I estimate that you know in 95 percent of the cases you will not be limited um, with uh, with this entity relations model so what are the considerations that uh, one might uh, think about when uh, when set up the the pools and uh, host assignment so the first one is basically uh, the optimal resource sharing. Obviously, you would like to reduce the amount of hosts that you manage, and uh, you would like to share as much as possible in order to utilize and uh, to save costs with regards to the total cost of ownership. Uh, another aspect is to ensure the hosts are available for test execution. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the the, there is a need to run performance tests and you don't want to block or queue anyone or at least to minimize that to uh, as much as possible. 
Um, another consideration is basically uh, all sorts of uh, special project consideration, like a specific project is located in a particular place and they need the machines to be located uh, in that area because the application is located over there and they will not be able to use any other any other roles located anywhere else. So this is definitely a consideration that needs to be taken uh, into mind. Uh, or a specific project is uh, much more intensive in, uh, in the day-to-day -day activity uh, comparing to a different one which is uh, kind of more idle and don't need uh, don't need uh, to, to utilize resources uh, on a very frequent basis. Um, you can also consider uh, paying uh, customers uh, comparing to such that are, are not paying for the service and maybe give a different uh, service level based on that. Uh, final consideration is basically the ease of maintenance for the administrator, uh, which is the less interesting consideration, I would say, but it's still there. I mean, uh, what happens uh, if my pools and projects are assigned in a specific way? What happens when a new project arrives? Um, how difficult it is for me to align the model with the new project? Um, what happens in case um, I need to remove OS from the system? How it, it applies? Uh, which project is going to be affected, which not. So these are not day-to-day -day consideration, obviously, but uh, very hard to predict. And uh, the, the same thing, uh, which basically that uh, the administrator will have to, to consider over and over, over again. So to be honest, there is no uh, a good answer, that uh, like a bulletproof answer that can satisfy all that. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to cover a few examples soon uh, that will get uh, get you stimulated about it and get you thinking about it. I'm sure that each and every one of you already has uh, some setup uh, in place. Uh, but basically what I suggest over time is to, to look at performance center resource utilization, the usage uh, reports. And basically uh, based on the information that you see over there, fine tune the, the current setup that, that you have. And uh, by, by looking at these reports, you can see the activity and the amount of machines uh, consumed by different projects uh, over a period of time. Uh, these reports allow you to, to see the, the concurrency uh, on the, the, all, of the, all of the performance center farm and uh, on a more uh, granular way, manner if you use the filter over here and basically um, uh, divide it uh, by a different project and see how each and every one of them uh, is doing and also you can look that over time. Other reports might be, uh, might be uh, useful as well uh, for this kind of exercise but eventually uh, these reports uh, will help you fine-tune and make the, the, the setup of the deployment more optimal. I would say that uh, that uh, Performance Center is currently in transition and uh, eventually will allow uh, working with dynamically allocated resources, which will reduce the total cost of ownership. But we we are still going to keep on maintaining the current uh, the current lab uh, as it is because we see a lot of functional benefit in that as well. All right, let's let's see. Uh, one example for Austin pool uh, setup, Austin uh, project uh, setup, and basically uh, we called it maximum resource sharing. So it's basically a very naive example where all of the projects are using a single pool that includes all of the hosts inside it. And uh, by that, uh, you can basically uh, ensure that uh, all projects have resources the availability is questionable the, um, and uh, while it's kind of easy for the admin to, to maintain because uh, you don't need to really think of what's going on if I'm going to uh, introduce a new project to the system, I'm just associating it with, a, with the same host pool and that's it. Um, so this, this type of deployment, while it looks uh, naive, it might be uh, very useful for um, for environments where the activity is moderate, is not that uh, that heavily utilized. It might also be good for uh, relatively small deployments of performance center. And um, then eventually, uh, like 
the, the projects that are using uh, the source pool um, will will gi- will get the the, the relevant uh, availability that they need that they need. Another option is uh, to go for to implement a complete segregation of um, between projects. It's basically dedicating uh, a separate pool for each project. Assuming uh, we are talking about uh, environment which which is heavily used. Assuming we are talking about environment where uh, each uh, project uh, needs the load generators to be located in a completely different location, you can think of many examples where where it fits. And let's say that where if these projects are actually very active, it means that uh, there might also be a competition inside the project for the resources, um, and uh, when uh, when they need to run some tests. And then the utilization reports can help you uh, identifying issues like that and seeing uh, if it uh, if the current allocation makes sense or maybe uh, there there is a need to allocate more resources to that project. The final example over here uh, is basically kind of an hybrid approach uh, between the two. So uh, in an environment where you have uh, highly active uh, projects and such that are less active and maybe uh, uh, the highly active project, maybe the pain project uh, can get a dedicated uh, pool uh, for the for them to use uh, without any uh, interference uh, from anyone else while the less active projects can get uh, can get the resources uh, shared between them and again based on um, on examining the, the behavior over time, uh, you can fine tune and see whether it fits. Uh, the main benefit of a model like that is that it kind of aligns the, the resource allocation uh, uh, to, to the actual usage and uh, provides uh, optimal resource utilization. Uh, it also gives a better service to uh, maybe to paying customers that can that, that can get uh, the, uh, their own resources and dedicated uh, the dedicated um, uh, kind of mini lab uh, of their own. Uh, I would say that uh, I try to um, to use also some shared resources that will be assigned to more than one pool, and in this case, I chose the data processors. Uh, because uh, the data processor is uh, eventually, uh, if you share it between different pools and between projects, uh, there is no concern that uh, data will leak between one project to another because eventually Performance Center uh, populates the data into the respective uh, project and uh, no one can actually uh, get into that machine. And uh, also, um, since you you might uh, want potentially to save some resources, and uh, based on the utilization, maybe you can can identify like uh, a few machines that will be uh, will be dedicated and shared uh, for the for several different projects, and by that uh, the functionality will keep on flowing, and still uh you will uh, uh, you will uh, utilize the resources in the most optimal approach so this is it for today uh, i hope uh, you found uh, this session beneficial uh, we try to make it to, to make it relevant for for performance engineers and for administrators in the future uh, we will uh, we will uh, create more webinars so should you have any ideas please contact Contact us, um, the PLV cost team, and uh, uh, we will definitely consider addressing that in uh, in additional webinars. So I'd like to really thank you for attending. Um, we'll definitely answer all the questions and uh, publish uh, both the, the slide deck, the recording, and the Q&A um, as soon as we can. Thank you very much. <laughs>